make it. Good evening, everyone. My name is Peter Smith. I'm the superintendent of schools here at Jamesville DeWitt. I want to thank everyone for being here. Um, it looks like we have about 40 or so participants, which is uh, pretty close to uh, the number of people that responded. Um, before we get going, I just want to um, uh, let everyone know that there are some district administrators uh, who are on the um, session tonight. Uh, that includes myself, Nate Franz, Assistant Superintendent for uh, Curriculum Instruction and Equity, uh, Peter Reyes, uh, Assistant Superintendent for General Educational Services, and Ms. Tracy Menapace, our Director of Pupil Personnel Services, uh, is here with us tonight as well. Um, obviously, uh, our Board of Education is here. Before we get going, I just want to um, share my screen and just go over a couple of um, uh, information pieces for you. First of all, we're very excited to welcome Dr. Amy Goodrum um, tonight and Ms. DeForest, our President of Board of Education. We'll do a little bit of an introduction in a minute. Um, our agenda tonight, uh, for everyone's information, we'll have a presentation by Dr. Goodrum. Um, we will then go into uh, breakout groups for 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, we have a couple of questions for people to work through um, in smaller sessions, um, questions around, you know, um, how did the presentation resonate with you and, and an opportunity for you to provide some feedback to the district on areas uh, that we're doing well and areas that we could um, look to improve. Um, we'll come back together. Um, and share out some of that information via a tool that we use called Thought Exchange that will be hosted and run by Assistant Superintendent Franz. And then we'll save some uh, time. I think people would be interested um, to do some question and answer with our, um, with our special guest tonight. So we'll save uh, 20 minutes or so at the end of the evening for that. And the way that we will organize the Q&A um, is through a moderation. Um, questions can be submitted through the chat. Um, and then I'll read those questions to Dr. Goodrum. Um, this should be um, a way to keep it um, organized and, um, you know, sort of um, uh, without a lot of people jumping on, just keeping the session organized. Um, in this day and age, we need to review some Zoom stuff. Um, and that is that um, during Dr. Goodrum's presentation, all of us will be muted. Um, during the breakout groups, which will be facilitated by either a district administrator or a board of education member, um, uh, participants will be unmuted. And I would ask if it's possible to have your screens on while you're in the small group so that we can um, build a little bit of a community and people can share out. Um, then when we come back to the live thought exchange, that'll be back in the large group session after the breakout groups are um, ended. Participants will be muted, but then we'll allow or we'll ask for contributions to be made uh, to the uh, thought exchange. And then finally, as I just mentioned, we'll do a Q&A at the end of the session um, where the questions will be submitted and, and moderated. Um, so I hope that provides information for everyone um, as we head into the evening. I'm looking very uh, looking uh, forward to the information Dr. Goodrum is to present and um, for uh, the community's feedback. So um, on behalf of the district administration, Dr. Goodrum, thank you for being here and I'll hand it over to Mrs. DeForest. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Good evening. And on behalf of the James L. DeWitt Board of Education, I would like to welcome and thank everyone for attending our community forum this evening. The board would like to thank Dr. Amy Goodrum for being our presenter and helping us discuss best practices and strategies to help our children move through the pandemic and beyond and to help us best support our students' development. The board has selected the topic of supporting students' social, emotional, and mental health as it has been a regular topic in our meetings and is one of the four focus areas of the Jamesville DeWitt strategic plan. We all recognize that the COVID pandemic, sorry, has had an impact on our students. It yielded a time of social isolation and uncertainty and has reinforced the importance of connectedness and supporting one another's well being. The board and our district administration value our communi community's forums and the opportunity for us to collectively as a community into a focus topic. Hang on one second. Let me just pause it. Sorry about that. Okay, so the board and our district administration value our community forums and the opportunity for us to collectively as a community delve into a focus topic 
and have a dialogue on how to best work together and support our students' well being. Again, thank you for attending. I'd like to thank our board members who are here tonight Dr. Sharon Archer, Jalal Zogby, Lisa McKenney, David Leach, Carolyn Souser, Renee James Murad. I think I got everybody. I'm trying to look through the screens and the pictures. So thank you for being here tonight. We greatly appreciate it. And again, we want to thank Dr. Goodrum for really taking the time to help us best support our students' social, emotional well being and mental health. And next, Dr. Goodrum will give us more details and introduce herself and start our presentation for the evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for, um, you know, it's really touching to be part of this with a with a big group like this. Um, and maybe someday we'll, we'll be in person, although I know that can be really challenging for folks with little ones at home. So this is a great format to do it. Um, but I, I want to know that I want you to know it means a lot to me. So thank you for that. Um, can I share my screen? Is that possible? Yeah. All right. Let me go ahead and try to do that. I say try because we never know how this goes. Okay. How's that looking, everybody? Can you see it? Okay. Yay. Jump in if you can't. So through the pandemic and beyond, best practices for our kids and their development. The subtitle is please don't freak out. <laughs> We've had a lot of worrisome news, a lot of worrisome uh, things happening in the community and things with the pandemic, and um, it's not always going to stay this way. So that's um, something that I, I do want to share. I've been in private practice for 23 years, and I have seen a lot of kids go through a lot of torment and get a lot, lot better. So I'm here to talk about what's going on currently give a little message of hope and support to parents and to teachers and also to our kids and talk about some really practical things that I think we could do at home uh, and in schools to, to support kids. So uh, just a little bit about me. Um, I graduated from Cornell University in 1989 from the College of Human Ecology. And the College of Human Ecology has a, a developmental psychology major, which, which was mine. I then went directly on to the University of Maine and got my PhD in clinical psychology there in 1995. And as part of that, uh, did my internship here at Upstate University Hospital. Followed that with a two-year fellowship at the University of Rochester Medical Center and uh, fast forward to 99 and I um, opened up my own private practice. And I really have a lovely opportunity to work with um, graduate students at Syracuse University currently. I supervise their work and their, their practicum work in the training clinic. Um, just a couple other things about me. I'm still involved with Cornell. I'm the uh, co-vice president of the um, Alumni Association Board uh, for the College of Human Ecology. I also have a thousand hours of yoga teaching under my belt and 500 hours of training. I'm a master trainer for Heart Zones, which is a technology and fitness company that um, specifically works with schools and uh, fitness clubs. So I do training for them and. Um, yeah, that, that enough about that. So I can I can speak a little bit to some of the biology and, and the work around exercise. It can also be helpful for our kids. So let me just see if I can get this going. All right, here we go. I want to speak to you from the perspective that's really closest to my heart and informs all of my decisions uh, in, in my clinical practice, which is child development, and really understanding kids from a developmental perspective. Because we all know that as they move through their lives, what they need changes and grows, and sometimes they revisit certain themes as well. So for us to really be able to talk about how to support our kids, we need to have a good understanding of what we're actually supporting, right? And the definition of child development, it really refers to a sequence of physical and language and emotional changes that occur in a child from birth to the beginning of adulthood. The beginning of adulthood, um, where that is defined is highly questionable. <laughs> you know, it used to be 13, some would say 18. I would actually argue 25 at this point. So, so the, the beginning is pretty is much more clear than, than, than where that ends. And of course, development occurs across our lifespan. Um, it's strongly influenced by genetic factors. So genes passed down from biological parents, but is also very much um, influenced by events during prenatal life and environmental factors. So, you know, when I was in school, in high school, we talked about nature versus nurture. It's not nature versus nurture, it's nature and nurture. 
Um, and, and we will see as we go through this, how that the pandemic has, has influenced that. Um, and so we often refer to stages of development, you know, um, and look for certain sort of predicted milestones within a fairly predictable yet kind of loose timeline, right? So a child, some children walk at like 10 months and you're like, whoa, others, they might walk at 18 months. That's not necessarily problematic, right? Language develops within a certain predicted framework. Lots of children, but not all between the ages of six months and 18 months go through stranger anxiety where you know, at five months old, they're cooing at every stranger they see, and suddenly they're pulling back at six months and going, who is that weirdo? Um, and that's predictable, right? And we hope they then eventually some, but not all grow out of it. So the definition of child development. And development includes a lot of things. And, and I'm going to try to touch on all of this. I know we're focusing on emotional development, but it's all connected. Our physical development is connected to our emotional development, is connected to others. So it, it, I want to speak about a child as a whole person, not just the mental health piece, because mental health is related to physical health. So physical skills, fine and gross motor, fine motor skills or finger skills, gross motor, whole body skills, speech and language. So understanding and using language, using it um, socially, that's under social interactions, also reading and communicating. Cognition is the ability to learn and problem solve. And as children get older, it's also the ability to pay attention to what you're thinking about and maybe even change what you're thinking about. So those are important skills also. Since we are sensory awareness, registration of sensory information for use. Some, some kids are highly sensitive. They sense everything around them, right? Other kids, not so much. Some kids right in the middle. And some kids you see a real variety around that, those patterns. Social interactions means interacting successfully with others. Doesn't always mean that's pleasant. Doesn't always mean it goes perfect, but it's relatively successful. And then emotional regulation, and we're really going to talk about that towards the end, which is mastering self-control, right? So being able, when you're having a big feeling, to make a moment-to-moment -moment decision about what you do, if anything, with that big feeling. So this is sort of the nuts and bolts of where I come from, which is Yuri Bronfenbrenner, and that's a mouthful. And he was one of my professors towards the end of his career at Cornell. Um, he developed what's called ecological systems theory. I'm not going to go over this too much, but I want I wanted to show it to you. Um, Yuri Bronfenbrenner was all the, also the person who pioneered Head Start, which was a fantastic preschool program that um, the funding lapsed for, but was was really uh, was really great. So, you know, if you look at the individual, and, and many of you are parents, uh, as am I, you know, we think about the individual, that, little, that kid right in the middle, and then the microsystem around them, their family, peers, school, church, health services, neighbors, right? And it's really important to understand, and the research really bears out that even with just a child and parent, it's not just the parent affecting the child, the child affects the parent. It's a, it's a dynamic and very fluid um, interaction, right? And how you parent is affected by what neighborhood you're in, right? Are you in a neighborhood where you can let your kids go out and play? Or are you in a neighborhood where they have to stay inside for safety? That affects your parenting. It affects your child's development, right? Are you in a neighborhood where there's, you know, gangs of kids roaming around and you're like, hey, that's great. Go out, play with those, play with that group, come back at six o'clock at night and you know that other neighbors are watching them? Or are you in a neighborhood where hmm, maybe not so much, maybe you're not so sure that those other parents are going to keep an eye on your kid? Um, is church important? How, uh, what's your access to school and what are the resources available at school? And then moving out from that into our broader community, and then even more broadly, attitudes and ideologies of the culture, which even, even with little ones, even if you uh, are appropriately shielding them from all kinds of information, the attitudes and ideologies of the culture are still gonna impact them fairly strongly. All right, so we've all heard the pandemic influences on development and none of it's been good. <laughs> So I'm just starting out with that. So we're going to review some stuff that's going to sound like hair on fire run out of the room. But I want to caution before we make any big judgments about what we're going to talk about. OK, we have to be really cautious about. And I, again, I'm approaching this as a developmental psychologist. We have to be cautious in making interpretations or drawing conclusions from what we know right now. The data is still being collected. 
the data we have is not current up through 2022. And um, it's going to take years for us to really figure out how the pandemic has influenced development and what that means for the future. Some effects on children may be very long lasting, while many likely are not. And I'm going to show you some examples of that, okay? We have preliminary data on how the pandemic has influenced development across the early lifespan. And by early lifespan, I mean birth to 18. But we still don't know the full reasons why. And that's really important because it's very easy for us to start to draw easy conclusions or quick conclusions, but all of this is quite complicated to parse out. And then the other thing to keep in mind um, is that aggregate data, which is like average data, so averages of test scores, the average kid, the average parent report, that's interesting and it's useful but it does not necessarily provide any meaningful information regarding your specific situation or your specific child or school district or neighborhood or community, okay? We live in a super, very cool and very diverse country. And what test scores are looking like in rural Oklahoma might be really different than what test scores are looking like in Queens, New York. We have such an incredible variety that if we give the same test to every kid across the country and then get an average, it might actually mean virtually nothing for your child or for your school district. So that's really important to keep in mind because with statistics, averages pull from the extremes to the middle, and that might not be very useful. So just keep that in mind. And we've seen clearly some developmental dips in the pandemic that at first glance look drastic. And I'm gonna show you some of those, but they're not necessarily predictive of long-term problems. The first thing to talk about is to appreciate the fact that we're here. <laughs> Honestly, we have 140,000 children in this country that were uh, that lost a caregiver. That's one in 500 children. One in 500 kids in this country lost a caregiver, either a parent, a custodial grandparent, or a grandparent caregiver. So that's huge, and that speaks to both taking care of our own children and possibly having some consideration for how do we look at the larger community and take care of others who might be in need because they're out there. There are huge racial and ethnic disparities with this, with um, children of racial and ethnic minorities accounting for 65% of, of those who lost primary caregivers. And unfortunately, we've lost children in this pandemic. So we lost nearly 600 children from the ages of birth to four years old, and we lost nearly 1,000 five to 18 years old. And this was from April, 2020 to June 30, 2021. So this does not account for 21 to 22. So those numbers went up, unfortunately. Um, and, I, and I present this not as doom and gloom, but as the stark reality that when we have, I don't wanna say the luxury to talk about mental health because that's too crude, but we're fortunate to be able to talk about mental health and helping our kids through that because they're still alive. So here are some of these, here are some of the things that like kind of light the hair on fire. Okay. <laughs> and I, I'm ha more than happy to share where these sources are from. I did not break down every study, you know, in psychology, we like to go over, over everything with a fine tooth comb. Well, where did you get the data from? How did you collect it? What are your methods? What are your statistics? And you guys would be, we'd be here for the next three hours and you would hate me. So we're just going to go over kind of the broad swaths of this. The, um, first study was done through Mass General. Okay. And we had a sample of about a thousand moms. And what it showed is that neurodevelopmental diagnoses at age one, it's a big word, um, some cognitive challenges, motor challenges, or language challenges at age one were significantly more common in infants exposed in utero to COVID-19, particularly if exposed in the third trimester. This was unvaccinated moms. So this was before the vaccine was out. Data was collected from like March, 2020 to like November, 2020. Interesting. So significantly different, even when they accounted for socioeconomic status, whether or not people had insurance and the kind of prenatal care they got. Ooh, okay. Uh, and then second study was from Brown who kept working with children and, uh, and studying babies, which was amazing. Pandemic born babies scored significantly lower than those born before the pandemic on groups of tests, on a group of tests that 
basically measure IQ, but I didn't want to use that word, uh, development such as language, puzzle solving, motor skills, babies from low income families experience the largest drops. So this is quite counterintuitive because what the psychologists were thinking was, oh, babies are at home with parents and caregivers. They're going to get all this time. They're going to get all this nurturing. It's going to be fabulous. They're going to look great. Not so much. Uh, so that's another one with young children. And here's one out of the UK. So children between the ages of eight months and three years in the United Kingdom, um, if they were in care, group care during the pandemic, their language and executive functioning skills were stronger. So if they were in daycare, basically, the benefits were more pronounced amongst children from lower income backgrounds. So you're starting to see the pattern here, right? The pandemic did not affect all of us the same. Children from uh, low income backgrounds, children of color, much more likely to be influenced in a negative way for lots and lots and lots of reasons that goes back to that ecology of human development from what's happening in the maybe in a smaller sphere of, of development to the larger sphere of what their, what their world is like. Okay, here's the big one. That's get it again. You know, everybody runs out of the room screaming. Pandemic influences on test scores, reading, and math. Notice that I say test scores. <laughs> I'm not saying on their global reading and math skills. Okay, because we really don't know how this is parsing out and how long this is going to last. But this was this is pretty big data. And um, if you read the New York Times, they had a very scary headline about it. So this was 450,000 fourth and eighth graders across the country in 10,000 schools, all right? All right, 26% of eighth graders were proficient in math. That was down from 34%, okay? And that was statistically significant. 36% of fourth graders were proficient in math down from 41% in 2019. Okay, guess what? Reading has been in a downward trend that began before the pandemic. This didn't help but it didn't make it that much worse, quite honestly. Kids are reading much and much less with the advent of well, screens, as are adults, by the way, it's not just kids. So that's a trend that was continuing. And, and students are still performing better in this test of math than they did 30 years ago. So that's also kind of interesting. So I'm not, I'm not poo-pooing this. Anybody who has a kid who's, who's challenged in these areas, I'm not minimizing that at all. I'm just trying to put it in perspective that, um, and, and, we are fortunate to be in New York State, and you're especially fortunate to be in the Jamesville DeWitt School District, where, you know, there are lots of services available to children, a lot more than other schools that I've worked with. So, um, so keep, so just bear that all in mind. And then, of course, we're going to get into the social emotional influences, and I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about things we can do in the household and in the schools, because we know it hasn't been good, right? It hasn't been good for a long time, everybody. Um, I have been in this field in my private practice for 23 years, but really I started seeing clients in 1993 when I was in graduate school. This trend has been going on since I started work. Um, nowhere have children suddenly looked better mental health wise. The trends have been getting steadily and steadily worse. We really started looking at this data in 2010, 2011, and the pandemic just blew the doors off. So when we hear, and there are some excellent news stories, um, Megan Coleman did an excellent one for News Channel 3 on several different areas of mental, mental health. Um, and yeah, very alarming and some alarming things in our, in our community, but it's been going on for a while. None of this surprised, I can tell you that none of this surprised us as psychologists, all right? And in the fall of 2020, hospitalizations for suicide attempt or self-injury rose dramatically, okay? In children's, I'm looking specifically at children's hospitals here across the country. So 43.8% among adolescents, 49.2% among girls specifically. Um, for girls, um, I will circle back to as to why that may be specifically for girls and young women. Um, but that's noticeable. Now that also doesn't keep in mind that also, we also need to consider that children's hospitals were more likely to admit kids. Um, there has been a time in our past, um, and I, I can attest to it, where kids would go to the hospital and go to the emergency room and be assessed and be very, very, very likely to be sent home. That has changed. So part of this admission is not necessarily that kids are worse, 
It's that hospitals are recognizing the problem and are more willing to admit and treat children. Okay. So um, again, uh, a concern, but not a freak out concern. And one of the big things that we've talked about a lot is that feelings of lonely, loneliness and isolation um, are continuing a longstanding trend of increasing across the lifespan. We're not just talking about kids and teens. Adult grownups, all of us, elders, this is nothing new. Um, our Surgeon General, Vivek Murthy, wrote a book in, 2000, in 2017, he made the argument that loneliness is actually a public health crisis. And he wrote a book about it called Togetherness, um, well before the pandemic, three years before the pandemic. So there are lots of reasons for this, right? And it's really, it's really easy for us to, um, I'd say, especially as parents, to point to screens and go, you know, social media and screens, you know, it's isolating, it's lonely. Not all the time. Sometimes that draws people together and sometimes that gives comfort to people. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes as we get more and more reliant on technology, uh, we can feel more isolated. And as we rely more on, and, and as people and families kind of spread out amongst the world, that's wonderful and we can do visits, but we don't necessarily have the social structures that are really close by to be really supportive to families. You know, I, I work with a lot of families for whom they're the only family here, their nuclear family, they don't have anyone else in town to kind of help them. So that that can be really challenging. So I want to I want to kind of switch gears from talking about sort of the big picture that's been going on, because we know that um, kids are in the middle of a mental health crisis and they are struggling to what could be contributing to that and what we can do as individuals. Loneliness is a huge part of what's going on here. I cannot, I cannot emphasize it enough. Loneliness is a mixed bag of feelings, right? So you feel, you feel sad. You feel like you're missing something or someone, but you're not quite sure what it is necessarily. There's a lack of comfort, right? There's sort of an irritation there and there's stress or anxiety around it. It's a mixed bag. But the biggest piece that starts to really, we really see in teenagers, especially, and in adults, is that when you feel lonely, there's a component of feeling ashamed and humiliated. Like somehow you're not worthy of someone else's attention. Or somehow you did something wrong that you're this lonely. If only I was like that person. If only I looked like that. If only I could, if I only if it was cool like that kid you know, there's a sense of self-shame and humiliation. And shame is an absolutely crippling emotion, okay? It's paralyzing because once you bump up against shame, which makes you feel so kind of sick to your stomach and critical of yourself, you have no logic or reason to work with. It hijacks, it hijacks the frontal lobes, it's done. Decision-making is terrible and so is emotional regulation. So when you find a kid who's very, very dysregulated, I can almost guarantee you that in some part of their life, they're experiencing shame of one kind or another. And they are not able to articulate it because it's a very complicated emotion. Or they're trying to work really hard to avoid and wall off from it. And then you also get acting out there. Shame does not allow us to trust ourselves. It does not allow us to trust other people. It does not allow us to show compassion. It doesn't allow us to be genuine and it doesn't allow us at all to be vulnerable. It is like that wall is up and you're done. And it is directly linked to loneliness, which we know the pandemic, the things that kept us safe, unfortunately, exacerbated loneliness, physical distancing, um, masking, you know, you'd go to the grocery. Do you remember when we were wiping down our groceries? I mean, you think about all the craziness we went through from like March, 2020 till, you know, like all of that loneliness, right? Could you hug somebody in the grocery store in the beginning? I mean, it was, it was pretty wild. So, you know, kids took all of that in too. I, so I want to speak directly to all of you who care for and love children, have children of your own and work with them on a daily basis, be it being a parent, being someone in a school district, being a teacher, being an administrator, mom, dad, aunt, uncle, grandparent. 
you need to take care, taking care to take self-care. And there is a shame epidemic that's happening that is parallel to the loneliness epidemic. And these are intersecting with the COVID epidemic. They're all going together. And, and I have no research to back this up. I am talking to you from my heart as a parent and as a psychologist and, and what I see in, um, in the work that I do and what I see kind of observing our society. And I have seen over many years, and it's just been exacerbated that parents are really siloed and they're really caught in a cycle of tons of conflicting information. Feed your kids whole butter. No, don't feed them dairy. We'll give them nuts so they don't get a nut allergy. No, avoid the nuts altogether. Um, they need to be in at least three sports and two music. No, only do two things at a time. Um, they should get three hours of screen time. No, they shouldn't get any screen time. You should take them to church. Don't take them to church. They're bored. Like you, parents can never, <laughs> like what's right, what's wrong, what's up, what's down. Constantly conflicting information. And there's a lot of comparison and judgment. I mean, parents judge each other, right? We all do it. There's a lot of criticism and a lot of ridiculous expectations, okay? So parents not only are experiencing ridiculous expectations, but they might be having ridiculous expectations. And I think that one thing to consider is really coming together as parents and really supporting each other from a place that's not judgmental and really trying to step into the shoes of the person next to us. Because I don't know your life. You don't know my life. You, you don't know what happened to me 10 minutes before I got on this call. And I have no idea what happened to you. So I need to really just be silent sometimes and listen and really, really be able to walk in your shoes so that we can support each other around some of this stuff. The other thing I have to say is that teachers in schools, I've seen more and more, and I've seen the trend really accelerate in the past 10 to 15 years or in society's crosshairs. I have seen teachers in school districts judged more unfairly and targeted for ridiculous kinds of things than, than any other uh, institution in our country. No one's going after banks like this. Nobody's talking about this in the auto industry. No, it's not like, but teachers in schools, are like the bellwether. So anytime society, oh, we we need to, you know, we need to feed kids tomatoes. Okay, we'll make, you know, school lunch has to have tomatoes. Oh, let's consider, you know, guns in schools. Okay, let's arm the teachers. Oh, let's, you know, we need to do this. Now we have, need more mental. It, it, it's like, it's like never ending. <laughs> and so I'm just asking everyone to take a, a big deep breath, you know, parents and teachers and, and find a way to really have some commonality around the fact that we all love our kids and we all want what's best for them. And all of you caretakers can't drink from an empty cup. So sometimes we mistake caring for our children as caring for our own emotional needs, but it's not the same thing, right? You can be an amazing teacher and go home and be completely empty at the end of the day. You can be the most fantastic parent. Your kid has the perfect grade, the best clothes, goes to school, gets all A's, and you're taking them here, there, and everywhere, and you have nothing left, right? Take care of yourselves, whatever that looks like, because we can't take care of our kids unless we take care of ourselves. And what we think we're doing to take care of our kids might not actually be taking care of their emotional needs. It might be fulfilling other needs, but it might not be fulfilling their emotional needs. So all of that is to say that I think we have a desperate need to listen to each other from a place of non-judgment and really basic respect, which I think we could all safely say is sort of um, gone by the wayside in our society lately. And we have an obligation to teach our children these skills, right? If we don't have them, we can't impart them. Social learning is a huge way that children learn how to emotionally regulate, how to communicate with other people, how to interact in a group. And if we're not modeling that, they're not getting it. <laughs> so we need to model it for our kids. Are we gonna be perfect at it? Heck no, we make thousands of mistakes all the time, but we're also gonna get thousands of times right if we're working on it. So switching gears, cause I think I've got about 20 minutes left. How do we support child development? So the goal at each stage of development be it from you know infancy on through to 18, is to produce healthy and age-appropriate independence across physical skills, education, relationships, and emotional development. 
Now that looks quite different in a two month old, right? Who's quite dependent on you than it does in an 18 year old. Yeah, so we have to adapt how we're parenting and what we're doing to support this as they get older. And that's the really cool thing about parenting. And that is one thing that I absolutely love about what I do is that I get to see kids across the lifespan. I mean, there are some kids that I've had the honor and privilege to work with for years and see them grow up. And it's it's really, it's really impactful to me. What has happened, and again, this is just what I'm seeing, and I'm and I don't have any research to draw on, is a general, general kind of trend to overdo for children while kind of simultaneously denying or not acknowledging their feelings. Um, what what I mean is, yeah, you know, they've got all the nutrition, they've got the best stuff in their in their bedroom, and that's awesome. And you know, they got what technology they need, and we're getting them everywhere, and we got them in the best school district, and there's lots of that um, sort of hustle culture around kids, but not necessarily acknowledging what they want and how they're feeling because we're kind of caught up in that. And it what ends up happening is it pulls for extremes in parenting styles. And typically the, the, the extremes kind of shake out as, and in general, this is this by no means may relate to everybody just showing you what I what I see is that um in a couple that's like a male female couple so the more traditional family that the mom might be kind of overly permissive and indulgent with feelings and dad might get overly punitive and suddenly you know the kid is in this canoe and dad's rowing over here and mom's rowing over here and the canoe is like not stable at all because the parents have gotten kind of pulled to extremes with their parenting and again, of course, this can happen in any family. I'm just using the uber traditional, like, you know, mom, dad scenario. The other thing that can happen is that we give in when a child is at the height of their discomfort, right? So kids melting, let's, and, you know, I we've all been there. I've been there. You're in Wegmans, kids four years old. I want that. We're not getting candy today. Sorry, but I need it, but I need it, but I need it. Escalating throws down, screaming in Wegmans, parents like, oh, good God, I can't take it anymore. I'm so embarrassed. Everybody's looking at me. Okay, just take the Twizzlers, right? Unfortunately, then you've trained your child <laughs> and your child has trained you that every time they go to that level, we're going to give in. So they're much more quickly to go there the next time. <laughs> and by the way, if anybody is sitting here going, oh God, that's me. Oh God, that's me. Oh, God. We don't need to be ashamed because we've all done this and we all have chances to undo it. Um, so, but but it is happening with some, some more frequency. This kind of lack of consistency really creates confusion and chaos in children. And, and, you know, there has been a trend, I would say, in our culture towards comfort, right? We're pretty comfortable for the most part. I mean, we've homes, they're generally heated. We've got electricity, we've got indoor plumbing. I will tell you, I when I was in graduate school in Maine in the late 80s, I, I went into houses that didn't have electricity or indoor plumbing. So, and, and most of them do now. Generally, we're pretty comfortable and I'm, I, I wanna think that I'm safe to say that with folks who live in JD. We've done that emotionally too. We kind of rush in and band-aid and rush in and take care of. We as adults, need to get comfortable with children experiencing appropriate levels of distress. I'm not talking about extremes. I'm not talking about disorders. I'm talking about appropriate levels of distress and discomfort because otherwise we accidentally exacerbate or increase their anxiety. If we're always swooping in, we are giving the message that they are not safe and they can't take care of themselves. And this looks very different with a two-year-old versus a four-year-old versus an eight-year-old versus an 18-year-old, right? And just something to consider. Let me switch to emotional regulation because that's really the, the meat and potatoes of what we're talking about here. Emotional regulation is a set of skills that develops across the lifespan. It's a mountain with no top, everybody. We're still learning it. I'm still learning it. <laughs> um, but we can set a really healthy foundation that can be created in childhood. There are many, many, many hundreds of thousands of people who have lived in this world that don't get a healthy foundation in childhood and figure it out as an adult. And that's amazing. 
And you hear testimony like that all the time. But we can give them a healthy foundation in childhood, which makes it easier as they, as they grow up, which is very cool. Emotional regulation is the ability to identify the feeling you're experiencing. Hi, oh, I noticed I'm feeling a little nervous. Safe to say, I actually am. Um, acknowledge the feeling you're experiencing. Say it to my son. I feel kind of nervous in front of this JD parents. They're kind of high pollutant. I, you know, I don't know. And make a choice about your behavior in moment to moment. And I choose to keep talking because that's what you have me here for, right? So I'm not going to let the nervous interfere with what I got to do, which is my job to, to hopefully impart something interesting. Feelings are not designed to tell us what to do. If they were, I would have had multiple car accidents on Route 5 driving from my office to Wegmans because I don't like it when people cut me off. I have very strong feelings about it. I choose to do nothing because if I did something, I'd be in a lot of car accidents. <laughs> feelings are not designed to tell us what to do. They are designed to tell us what to pay attention to. That's why we have them. That's why we've evolved with them. If evolution didn't support feelings, we wouldn't have them. So that's really critical. And I'll go into that a little bit more as we move forward. Big feelings do not equal big actions. I can feel really, really, really excited and happy, but that doesn't mean I'm jumping up and down in front of a family in my office. I mean, I hear wonderful things all the time where I just want to like go yippee, but that would be really inappropriate with people sitting in my office. So I, I inhibit that. Likewise, big negative feelings, you know, we all have them. Doesn't mean we act on them doesn't need to equal big actions. Sometimes big feelings need to equal a really small action, right? Okay. And by the way, I'm putting this in a PDF so you don't have to write all this down. So you guys will get it later. Let me just talk about this in general and then I'm gonna get more specifically into feelings and how we can help kids with those in our daily practice. Supporting development, discipline is a practice. Discipline is also a mountain with no top. And by that, I mean, you're always climbing it. You might find it might be easy sometimes and it might be hard sometimes, but we're always learning how to be better at it. And I separate discipline from punishment. Punishment is um, generally involving help uh, creating shame in a child, honestly. Punishment is um, tends to be more severe. Children don't learn anything from it. If anything, they learn to just be angry at being punished. So punishment's not, I, I don't, I, punishment is not effective in shaping human behavior. It might stop a behavior, but it doesn't shape up a desired behavior, okay? Discipline is teaching your child something over time, over the thousands of times when you have to set a limit, give a structured choice, or give a consequence. Those thousands of times they're starting to learn something about how to manage themselves, how to manage their internal states and how to communicate with you when they're under distress. Just as a rule of thumb, if you wait until you're angry to discipline your kid, you're le way less effective. Disciplining from an emotional place, <laughs> they've got you. They're like, ha ha, dad's angry. Okay, ball's rolling now. Let's see what I can ask for. Their kids are great. Oh, we've made it, we've, you know, He's PO'd now, now what's gonna happen? The way to your anger, you're much less effective. So pay attention to those feelings. Hmm, starting to get irritated. These kids are getting pretty loud. Intervene then, don't intervene when you're like, I've had it, it's enough. Your tone of voice and your body language reveal your intention. And I'm gonna give you a great example. Thomas, let's stop jumping. Let me, you know, could you please stop jumping on the couch? Let's, let's not jump on the couch anymore. You don't want to really jump on the couch. Do you? Your child knows when they've got you over the hill, right? Your, they know what your intention is and they know that that kid kept jumping and jumping and jumping until mom's screaming. And then what's going to happen. They're probably going to jump three or four more times before they get off. So they got like 10 more jumps in because at the beginning, mom didn't say, couches aren't for jumping on, go jump on the trampoline. Your kid knows when you are not gonna follow through, whether you're a teacher or a parent, they know it before they start. And how do I know this? They tell me, <laughs> I know all their secrets. They know before you even vocalize whether or not you're gonna follow through. Your child internalizes your voice. How we learn self-management and emotional regulation 
is we take those voices and the people from our outside world and we internalize them, right? This is object relations theory. We don't need to go into it. So your voice matters. What kind of voice are you using? Are you punitive with the kid? Are you shaming them into behaving? Well, nobody else is doing that. I don't know why you are. Is that the kind of voice that you want them to carry through to adulthood to shape their behavior or to help them with emotional regulation? Just something to consider. Lastly, not every moment is teachable. And teacher parents fall into this trap all the time because they, they're great at teaching and they got the pedagogy and they try to teach their kids. Not every moment is teachable. When Tom is slapping Johnny, Tom goes <laughs> to time out. It's not a teachable moment when a kid's being aggressive, okay? So just know that and know that you're not missing things if you, oh, darn it, I should have said it this way and did that's all right. You get enough, you get it. We get lots of chances with our kids. The hugest thing that I've seen that we've lost as our culture and I would like to see come back is reflecting feelings in how we talk about children. You cannot help a child understand their feelings and talk about them unless you reflect it to them starting from when they're little. They don't understand what feelings are. I think about how you started to understand what anger was. Think about how you understand what excitement is. The problem is in our culture, we go right to behavior. Don't throw the book, get your hands off the other kid, walk in line, um, eat your dinner, go to bed right now. I told you to go to bed. We go right to behavior. We don't acknowledge the feeling behind what's going on. So before commenting on a kid's behavior, and this is really specific, everyone. I'm really, 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 really hoping that you will try this at home. Please try this at home. Acknowledge the feeling that you think is behind that behavior. So kid comes home, throws, you know, they know the rule. You put your book bag down, you hang up your jacket, you go get snack. Throws the book bag down, throws the jacket down, runs to their room. If you say, get in here, pick up your book bag. What the heck is going on? you've completely invalidated what's likely happened before that kid walked through your door. But if you say, hey, 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 I see something, it looks like something really upsetting just happened. Maybe that's why the books got thrown. Like maybe, maybe you wanna talk about that a little bit. You're soothing that kid. You're saying, hey, I'm meeting you where you're at emotionally. You're still gonna have them pick up the books. Don't get me wrong. But until you meet where they are emotionally, you can't change the behavior because we don't want to change the behavior. We want kids to want to change their behavior. And they cannot do that if we don't support their emotional life. Kids jumping up and down in the hallway. Do you see these pogo stick kids? Yeah, in elementary school, jumping up and down, jumping. You're not supposed to jump up and down and they're banging into their friends and they're being a pain, right? You look very happy at the moment. However, hmm, let's try to keep our feet on the ground. <laughs> You know, you just signal instead of, hey, you're banging into, you're banging into Sally over there. Stop it. And then the kid feels ashamed, you know. So just some examples of how we reflect feelings. Oh, boy, it seems like you're feeling really frustrated. Seems like a lot of strong feelings are happening right now. I use that when I'm like, I don't know what's going on, but they'll tell me. I can see you very kid chatty in school. That This was my son. Talked his whole way through third through fifth grade. Da, 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 da. I can see her feeling very social right now. However, everybody needs to concentrate, you know. Uh, hint, children will tell you if you get it wrong. I get it wrong all the time. Seems like you're frustrated. No, I'm just a little annoyed. Okay, got it. Just a little annoyed. You know, you are teaching them lots of different language for lots of different feelings. Super important. Do not ask what a child is feeling. Oh, how are you feeling now? Billy Joe? Billy Joe is going to be like... Oh, I feel like I don't want to tell you anything, <laughs> right? When we're asked what our feeling are, we feel, we feel confronted and we feel ashamed because we want people to get it. So reflecting a feeling is super important. Here's what not to do. I don't like to go over what not to do, but I feel compelled to, okay. Please do not deny a feeling or try to convince a kid otherwise because it teaches a child not to pay attention to their feelings or share them. This is the opposite of helping develop emotional regulation. We have all done this. Do not worry, you haven't ruined anybody, but we're gonna to work to minimize doing this. 
kid's upset. I, you know, I can't believe that kid was so mean to me on the bus. Yeah, but he wasn't mean the day before. So it's like, you know, it's okay. You know, he probably won't be tomorrow. He just completely denied the kid's feelings. Um, kid doesn't want dinner. I can't, this dinner's, I can't believe you served this to me again, mom. You're so lucky to have food. Think of all the starving kids in insert country here. I don't know if anyone uses that anymore, but I sure heard it as a kid, you know, but for whatever reason, the kid is not liking the food. It could have nothing to do with the food. There's maybe something else going on there saying it. Well, it's really okay because, or this is, this is, <laughs> this happens. No, you don't really feel that way, but they do. They just said it. So why would we say they don't or don't use that? Whatever word it's inappropriate. Usually it's like, hate. Like, I hate that kid. Don't use the word hate. That's inappropriate. You know what? That's how they're feeling right there. And using the word hate is way better than saying, I want to hurt myself. I'm so angry. I want, you know, I want to hurt myself right now because it's not going to last. That strong feeling doesn't last very long. Or I can't believe you feel that way after everything I do for you. You know, the sort of martyr thing that just teaches kids to be angry. And again, all of us are probably looking at this going, oh God, oh yeah, yep, yep. Been there, done that. And that's okay because we're working on changing it over time. When you acknowledge a child's feelings, you create access to emotional regulation through limit setting, structured choices. You give a child a chance to do the right thing and consequences is needed. And this lovely little sequence of how we discipline kids is in this book, which is one of the best books ever written. How to Talk So Kids Will Listen and Listen So Kids Will, will Talk. I had the opportunity to um, hear a lecture from Adele Faber about 30 years ago now. And they worked with a psychologist, Heim Gannat, who started the Child and Adolescent Clinic at the University of Rochester Medical Center. It is how we language what we want to say to kids. Um, it is a sequence of how we do that. And um, everybody in the world should have this book. So if there's one parenting book, you can throw out all the others and grab this one. And it feels weird at first, and it feels strange to language things like this. And it's been the best thing that I've learned as a parent and also in my practice as a psychologist. So I can't speak highly enough to it. Really quick, I'll wrap up because I know at 7.55 we're supposed to transition, but I want to get in this anxiety piece because this is really what we're seeing most of. And by the way, happening well before the pandemic, pandemic made it worse. Anxiety is an emotional experience on a continuum, right? So it's it uh, from stress to paralyzing fear. And we all need a little stress for a motivator, okay? Anxiety is an instinct. It's built within us. There's a reason why we still have it. it has a biological feedback system that's pretty awesome. So you science teachers and every, you know, and physicians and everybody in, in this group has heard of the fight or flight mechanism. That has to do with anxiety. You know, you perceive your organism, your brain perceives a threat. Immediately, you start to release a cascade of hormones that changes what's going on in your body. Digestion shuts down, which is why people feel nauseous. Why kid, anxious kids are like, oh, my tummy. It's, <laughs> yeah, because it's actually, it's actually happening. Why they feel sweaty? Because blood goes from the inside of the body, is shunted to the outside, opens up the pores so you can sweat. Sometimes heart rate goes up, respiration increases, but sometimes shallow breathing also increases, which is a problem because if you're breathing in a shallow way, you're getting in a lot of, you're not getting out all the carbon dioxide that you need to, and you can get a little woozy, which is why kids, oh, I'm dizzy, I had a headache, I had to sit down. Yeah, they're, they're experiencing all that. So stress is a normal, the stress response and occasionally panic are actually a normal part of our lives. And we need to help kids understand um, what's normal anxiety versus what is abnormal anxiety versus what is an anxiety disorder. Those are very, very different things. And I think what's happened in our culture is we conflate any anxiety with an anxiety disorder, and it's not accurate. We cannot learn to manage anxiety if we are never allowed to manage it successfully, either by being completely overwhelmed and think of PTSD and a lot of trauma. You know, if you're overwhelmed, your brain really doesn't allow you to learn to process uh, anxiety successfully. However, you can unlearn that with the appropriate therapy. You also cannot learn to understand and manage anxiety if you're totally protected, which is bubble wrapped. Okay. So I know we've talked about helicopter parents. We talked about snowfalls. I'm talking about bubble wrap. <laughs> so bubble wrapping your child keeps them safe, right? 
in the short term, but it makes them fragile in the long term. And I am not saying put your kid out on 690 and make them walk home. What I'm saying is children need to be exposed to appropriate levels of stress and learn how to deal with it on their own. At times they will not be successful and you will help them with it, but you cannot learn to manage it unless you do it. Some Nobody can do it for you. Children may go through periods of anxiety without it becoming an anxiety disorder, even though at the time their behavior looks disordered. This can last for a couple of weeks. You know, what is going on with this kid? This is like, what? And then it settles down. So we don't need to jump the instant some, we see something. You should consult with other people. Talk to others. Talk to teachers. Talk to other parents. Have you ever seen this? Like my kid's doing this thing. You know, talk to your pediatrician. Like recruit the other people in your life. Talk to grandma and grandpa if they were helpful. Don't just assume that something terrible is happening. The type of support we provide depends on the needs of the child, right? So how we support a two-month-old is very different than how we support a 10-year-old. And unfortunately, we can easily reinforce and create anxiety, anxious responding in our children. So one of the ways that's done is by completely denying it. Oh, you're not worried about that test. Come on, you always get A's. Hmm. Yeah, but they just said they were worried about it. Or giving anxiety attention at kind of exactly the over soothing at the wrong time. You hurt your finger? Oh my, I'm going to give you a, a personal anecdote. And then I know I'm going to go for two more minutes and then we'll break out you guys. We had a family come, we, I live right near Toggenberg and years ago, it was their first time skiing. And this was a very overly attentive mom, seven-year-old boy, T-bar hits him in the back of the knees. He falls over. Okay. He immediately goes to uncontrollable sobbing and screaming. And I'm like, eh, it didn't look so bad. I'm not so sure. So they go into ski patrol. Kid is completely hysterical. You can see nothing. Mom's freaking out. Um, ski patrol is like, I don't know. You know, you could take him to the emergency room. Parents take him to the emergency room. The diagnosis was he had a contusion. Contusion is a fancy word for bruise. <laughs> um, parents came back home and carried him up the stairs. That was overly solicitous in an anxious moment. I'm not saying the kid wasn't anxious and scared. It doesn't feel good to get hit, hit by the T-bar in the back of the knees, right? However, if they had maybe approached this differently, honey, let's sit here for a few minutes. Let's move that knee back and forth. All right, yeah, you're pretty upset. Let's give this another few minutes. Let's go in and get a hot chocolate. We'll sit down. Let's see how we're doing. We might have been able to avoid the whole emergency room thing to diagnose a bruise. Nope, let me see if I can move forward here. So, and I don't say that again, to minimize what kids are going through right now in terms of the pandemic. I'm just pointing out that sometimes we can accidentally overly pay attention to anxiety and accidentally increase it. We can teach children to really successfully manage anxiety by reflecting their feelings, by helping them identify where they feel it in their body. Oh, I see it in your tummy. Let's do some tummy, like you can do some tummy rubs. Maybe that will help. Let's sit up tall, you know? Oh, let's breathe right into that belly and see if that helps for a few minutes. Also help them understand it's not going to be in a quick fix. It takes a while for that anxiety response to go down. These biological and emotional sensations are a normal response. And we've had a lot of that response because we've been in a pretty abnormal situation. So having anxiety in an abnormal situation is normal. <laughs> Sometimes very strong feelings happen. We can tell this to children. Sometimes very strong feelings happen when we don't expect them because that part of our brain literally can't tell the difference between being chased by a lion or standing in a line that's taking an hour and a half long at Wegmans. Both are perceived as threats. We also have to help them understand that the physical feelings will go away over time and will not last forever. The anxiety response, even a panic attack, it can't last that long, 20, 25 minutes max, and then it burns out. And giving them agency to help themselves through cultivating an awareness of their thinking patterns, physical interventions they can do for themselves, and appropriate distraction and self-talk. Those are key. These are all things that help with anxiety. And if we do this, everybody, from a young age on, 
we are creating human beings who have much more access to managing their own internal life and sharing it with us in a healthy way. And by the way, this helps with everybody, not just kids, spouses, bosses, teaching people you teach with, vice principals, <laughs> school board members, helps with everybody. So I've done enough talking. I think you guys probably want to do some of your own. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. That was terrific. Um, I just want to re um, go back just to uh, prepare people for um, next. Just recall, uh, we're now going to jump into some breakout groups, have some questions uh, for people, then we will come back to the whole group. Um, the breakout groups will give us some time to think about, process um, in a smaller group, the, the words and recommendations um, from Dr. Goodrum. Um, then we come back to a live thought exchange where we can share out some of that information and then do some Q&A uh, to end the evening. Um, as we head into breakout groups, um, I have some uh, prepared questions. Um, you don't necessarily have to stick to these questions, um, but just some uh, things to get you going. Um, I will put those questions into the chat uh, once we go into the breakout room, so you'll have them available for you. And um, I've randomly just put people into breakout groups just um, um, for expediency. Um, every breakout group should have either uh, a district administrator or a board member or both uh, who can help facilitate the conversation. Um, and if uh, you're not immediately invited to join a breakout group, I will assign you as quickly as possible. Um, that may have happened. Someone may, might have joined later or whatever. So with that, um, I'm going to um, open up the breakout rooms. If you would join your breakout room, we'll do this for 20 minutes. I got 8.03 on my clock right now, and then I will put the um, questions into the chat. Sorry, I went over there, Peter, but I wanted to get it all in. All good. <laughs> Just gotta get some people into some breakout rooms here. And for CNY Central and Spectrum News, I did not put you guys into breakout rooms. Not sure why Bimpy is not hmm. oh, is uh, assigned to room two. So hopefully that person will go to room two. So you got a little uh, 20 minutes, got stuck the clock. You're good to take a little deep breath and a break. <laughs> But that was great. Thank you. I hope that hit all the points. I I um I, I I'm I'm just looking to help people have a more realistic expectation for what you know moving through this, and not be so to be appropriately concerned. <laughs>
we got about 45 seconds left. Feel free to keep rating. All right. I'm going to actually leave the exchange open so that um, if other if you wanted to go back and, and do some additional ratings, that would be great. But um, some of the thoughts that sort of rose to the surface um, were providing on-site mental health services is a great step forward for the school. Um, so this is an effort um, that the district and the board has have invested in in terms of adding uh, on-site mental health clinics at the middle school and the high school. Um, and uh, for, for those who, who may not be aware of, of that, um, but so it's easily accessible. They don't need to leave school. So we continue to think about ways to expand that service and, and service for students. Put in place social emotional curriculum at all grade levels, especially at the middle school. Um, events like this. So it's great to hear from experts around issues that parents and schools care about. Uh, so there are some very actionable components in here, which is great to see, and we will be able to provide this presentation to staff, which we will be able to follow up on. And when I was looking through, I found, um, you know, several uh, low hanging, easily uh, implementable components, T train teachers to have one to three mindfulness activities they can lead. These are things that we can absolutely take action on sooner rather than later. So these are these are great ideas of both big uh, institutional changes and um, small um, small wins that we can we can start implementing as soon as next week. So I appreciate everybody's um, work uh, adding to this particular thought exchange. We will be able to um, uh, share it uh, the sort of results along with that searchable, um, and folks will be able to click through, and we'll also be able to sort it out by elementary, middle, and high so that we can pass it along to the staff uh, and administrators from each each one of those schools. So I appreciate everybody's participation and um, just first glance, it, it incredibly useful. So thank you for thank you for that. Thank you, Nate. That was tremendous. <clears throat> um, we want to provide time for participants to ask um, Dr. Goodrum any questions. So what I'm going to do is um, let's open up the chat and allow people to submit any questions that they might want. Um, put those, the chat will come uh, right to one of the um, co-hosts and we'll be able to read those um, right for uh, Dr. Goodrum. So uh, if you wanna put in a, a question for Dr. Goodrum, you should be able to, you should be able to do that. Dr. Goodrum, while we're waiting for someone to ask a question, anything uh, come to mind while um, folks were in their breakout groups? Anything you forgot to mention, want to mention, something you want to highlight? I don't, I, one thing I wanted to mention, and I've definitely experienced this in my life as a parent, is that it's really hard to know where a child's anxiety ends and where ours begins. And it's almost this kind of visceral thing. Like I, I distinctly remember once my son, he was, my son's 20 now uh, and in college, but he was about seven or eight and he had some horrific nightmare that I was already up and he, and my, my husband was out of town. He flew out of bed and he's just like sobbing and clinging to me. And I'm like, 
he's like, I had this terrible nightmare. I, I don't even want to talk about it. I can't. And I remember my own anxiety kind of like, just like this whoosh, you know, of like, oh my God, he's in like danger or something. And I remember thinking very distinctly, like, I need to, I need to manage this. So this doesn't get worse. Like I had to really consciously like stop my own physical reaction and emotional reaction to kind of be there for him. And it was not easy. And so I, I get where um, that can be re- very challenging. So I just wanted to add that in. Okay, um, jump in with some of these questions. Uh, Dr. Grenham, these are for you. Are there particular times of the year when parents should be particularly observant for stress or anxiety in children? Yes, it's not the first marking period. <laughs> it's the second and third. <laughs> um, most definitely, uh, especially as they get into middle and high school. Um, holiday, you know, also things that are exciting and fun also create stress, right? So you might take a week vacation in Spain or something or, you know, Adirondacks or whatever. And if you have a kid who can be prone to sort of anxi- anxious reacting or stress, you might see it then. Um, but in terms of times of year, winter is definitely not the easiest time of year around here on kids. Second and third marking periods, especially in high school, that third marking period is just a kicker. You're going to really see it amp up. Yeah. How about, um, do you have any suggestions on ways that schools or parents can help kids process the anxiety that they had to deal with during the pandemic? We're excited to return to normal. It was almost a rush to not address those feelings in school. Right. And they will come back. So here's my, my experience of this from what I'm seeing is that certain things and certain growth kind of stopped in 2020, not just for our kids, for us as well. So let's say uh, your child was six in 2020 and is eight in 2022. They're still having the emotional life in some ways of a six-year-old rather than an eight-year-old. And I'm not saying they're not going to catch up because they will. But um, I think it's really important to have conversations. Oh, geez, remember that? Like I said to you guys, remember when we were wiping down our groceries? Like that was like the most, if I, if I had to point to one thing that's like the most ridiculous thing about the pandemic, it was me in my garage, like wiping down my groceries. Like you can point to the things that are challenging, but also the things that are kind of ridiculous. Um, and yeah, and answer their questions when they when they have them. You know, one of the things we worry about is that I think as parents and caretakers is that we need to protect kids from strong feelings. We actually just need to, we need to allow them to experience it in a way that's healthy for them. Um, we can't protect them from it because life is hard and, and we have negative emotions and, it, and that those are okay to have. How about, do you have any thoughts on how to support special needs students? And I, I think that's probably with anxiety. Yes. And it is, um, it yes, and they may need more immediate care and more um, clearer languaging around that. So it depends on the needs of the child. Um, let me, if I may, speak to autistic children because I work with a fair amount of autistic kids, and they have a really unique and really cool set of strengths that they come to the table with, and some challenges that they face. And one of the challenges that they face is kind of coming into the world with this baseline level of anxiety around social life, because unlike what we've thought, we've thought for years that um, kids on the autism spectrum, like don't read social cues and don't get it. They're actually the opposite. They're extremely sensitive to all of this, to the point where I've got a stim, I've got a spin, I've got to look around. They're, They're picking up on all the cues. And it's completely overwhelming. It's sensory overload all the time socially. So then when they speak, they're going to look away. They might speak rapidly. It might seem kind of odd. Whereas neurotypical kids, they can kind of filter out most of that and, you know, seem pretty cool. So especially for kids on the autism spectrum to really meet them where they're at. um, A lot of times those kids are really fantastic visual thinkers and will see things and point out things that I couldn't possibly imagine. Um, so speaking to their strengths and knowing what those are will help them mitigate anxiety. The other thing I would say is most kids have a tell. Um, autistic kids struggle with emotional re- regulation, just like neurotypical kids, but it might be, it, it takes them a bit longer and it's a little more challenging to be able to sort of articulate feelings and get those out. 
but usually physically they'll they'll tighten up they'll they'll move a certain way if you really observe kids you can find their tell when they're starting to amp up and you can help them with that as that's happening because once they've spilled over and they're kind of you know melting down we we can't really help them except manage at that point so how do we identify those students who may be struggling with anxiety that tends to be internalized versus externalized? Well, they're missed, right? So we always say that the internalizers fly under the radar at school, right? The, these are the kids who are like the best behaved in your classes. <laughs> they're like, man, she's wonderful. She raises her hand, she answers everything. She's really quiet, you know, there's no problems. They they fly under the radar because they, they put on a really good face. So um, I would say, for every kid that's looking great, just be aware that there might be something going on there too. There might not be, but you can kind of tell if a kid's perfectionistic, right? If they get a 98 instead of a hundred and that's pretty disturbing to them, chances are there might be some internalizing anxiety going on there. If you see them kind of quiet and not really necessarily with, they don't need to have a gaggle of friends, but a couple friends, you know, if they're kind of isolated, if their body language is sort of droopy, those are cues to pay attention to. Many of our students of color experience racial, racial isolation in the current social context on top of the impacts of the pandemic. How do we best support students who are isolated based upon their identity? I think that really speaks to a, a broader question of who's in the school building with them. Who Do you have teachers of color? Do you have counselors of color? Do we do, you know, who, who are the adults in the school world with them to, you know, be allies and to help, you know, appreciate their circumstance and what they're dealing with. So that, that I think is important in terms of the broader, bigger social context, like hiring practices are, <laughs> hiring practices are important. Um, and I think it's, I think it's a great question. And, you know, as a white woman, I'm like the worst person in the world to answer this effectively. But um, I would say any kind of training for staff, anything that's available to bring in, because it's pretty clear that um, it, it's pretty clear that racism, unfortunately, is alive and well and is impacting our kids in a negative way. How about, do you have a good resource to teach short exercises that kids could do in their seat, almost with no one noticing if they're experiencing stress or anxiety? Um, I, can't, I can't point you to a specific um, resource, but I will say that anything that provides grounding is helpful. And grounding is literally putting your feet flat on the floor, feeling your feet in your shoes and your shoes on the ground, your seat in the chair, um, and that sort of feeling of gravity, like settling you into your space. So, you know, and, and we can, you know, talked about in, in that feedback mindfulness exercises, you know, feeling your arms in the, in the chair, your seat in the chair, your feet on the floor, that in and of itself, sometimes just focusing on those sensations can start to mitigate a bit of anxiety and keep a kid in a classroom. And nobody knows that they're doing it, right? Because they look like they're just sitting there. The other thing that I teach, and I will tell you that I have many, many kids who look at me like I'm crazy, is box breathing. Because everybody says, take deep breaths when you're anxious. Guess what? It doesn't work when you're anxious unless you practice it when you're not anxious. So if you have an anxious kid and you're like, well, take some deep breaths, here's what you're going to get. <laughs> and they're making themselves worse. <laughs> so we can't teach them. We can't teach it to them when they're anxious. Deep breathing is sitting in your chair grounded through your nose, inhaling slowly and through your nose, exhaling slowly, not through the mouth. Mouth breathing will increase anxiety. They can put their hands on their belly and feel their diaphragm move in and out. Um, and box breathing is doing it to a count of four. And sometimes they even trace a little box on their on their desk while they're doing it. And kids will look at me like, "You're on, well, there's no way, lady, that I'm doing this. But eventually they come around. <laughs> I don't know what it means when I, as you were talking, instantly put my feet on the floor and felt my seat in the chair. I'm not sure exactly <laughs> right? what that means, but... 
Um, uh, what signs should parents look for to determine when anxiety has become a problem? How, how do I know when to seek outside help? It's such a good question. And I wish I had a really definitive line to give you for this. But what I would say is if after a few weeks, three or four, anxiety is restricting your child's normal activities and interests and quality of life, that is when you seek help. You know, if they're like really into gymnastics and then for about three weeks, they're like, eh, I don't want to do gymnastics. I'm too scared. And I'm also scared of this. And I don't want to leave your side. That's a pretty good indicator that you want to get some kind of talk to your pediatrician and maybe seek some guidance around that and talk to the school to let them know because they might have some insight into it. This one is a statement and a question. It's very hard to find therapists for kids. The therapists available are ones that are graduate students, which causes anxiety when a child has to go through multiple therapists as therapists graduate from programs. You have a comment on that? Yeah, <laughs> I totally agree. It's rotten. Listen, we have a fantastic graduate program in clinical psych here. Um, the students are very strong. They do transition out after a year. It is, it is anxiety producing to have to switch to another provider. It absolutely is. And the alternative is no provider. So I'd say if that is your resource, hang on to it. What I would like to see, and this speaks to the ecology of development, so the bigger system, I want those grad students to stay here. They come to Syracuse for four years and they leave. Why aren't we attracting them to stay here? Why don't we have any, barely any therapists of color in, in, in our county? Why don't we have any psychologists, barely any? Because they come to Syracuse University and they learn all this stuff and they go. So how can we make this area, which is, hey, I've lived here like 30 years. I think it's pretty decent. Why aren't we attracting people to stay here? How can we do that? How can we partner with Syracuse University, with hospitals, with the county to encourage people to live here? We might need to put some things in place to have that happen. Just a comment and a question. I love your approach and especially the parenting skills and nuggets of wisdom. How have you seen schools best integrate these practices and address the mental health needs for students and their social groups and communities? Who I am not an expert on what schools are doing because I work with individuals. So I... Um, so I, I have a hard time commenting effectively on that. What I would say is um, any kind of curriculum that helps children identify emotions and talk about emotional regulation, if we start that in kindergarten and we continue it through in some kind of way, that can be super, super helpful. I know that sometimes, I, I mean, I, I guess I've kind of seen it that like health classes and maybe some of these curriculums can be a little bit of a political football, but I, I don't care where you land on that. Everybody needs to know how to identify and process emotions. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> how about, can you provide a list of local resources for schools so staff can refer students and families for more support outside of school? Um, I wouldn't have that. There is I believe there's a uh, there's something with the county mental health something with uh, Onondaga County that does have a list of resources. I I personally don't, um, and I I am aware as it is with my own caseload how everybody is full and not being able to take people. Like I get that it is it is a significant significant problem in this in this county, and I will tell you that from 2020 to 2021, I was working 14 to 16 hours a day and I'm not anymore because I can't sustain it. But in the immediate crisis, that's, I mean, I, I would, this desk that I'm at now, I was there 16 hours a day. Um, and a lot of people were, but, but it's not sustainable. You can't, you know, drink from an empty cup. So I think um, that's, there is, I believe it's called the Mental Health Association of Onondaga County. They would have a list of those resources. And then how can we encourage our own kids to be good peer supports to their fellow students? Is that too much to expect a kid to absorb at any age? 
not at any age. Some kids are going to be better at it than others. You know, some kids are, are more other focused and some are more self-focused and that's fine. But I would say um, the biggest hesitation for kids, and this is changing, which is really great, is to get an adult involved when they see a problem or they hear a problem, right? Because especially with the teenagers, um, it's very hard to know, are they joking or is this serious? I don't know. But any, I would say to a kid, if your gut makes you ask that question, you need to tell an adult about it. You know, sometimes that sarcasm is right on the edge and you're not sure, like, what? Do they really mean it or not? If you're asking yourself that, ask the kid that. And if you're still not sure, then, you know, go to an adult, that that's okay. I think kids, just like parents, need to be taught that it does take don't just rely on your own self-judgment. It takes a bunch of us to help somebody who might be in trouble. And there was a question, I think, for um, the administration. Does JD have a social emotional curriculum? And Mrs. Menapace, would you like to answer that question? There you go. Um, yes, we do. So currently right now in our elementary um, buildings, we are, I believe, heading into, we've just, I think it's year two of our second step curriculum. I had to stop and think for a second. Um, so we do do second step. Um, we have also provided it in our UPK program because as you know, the district has um, UPK classrooms. Currently right now at the secondary level, we have um, staff in both the middle school and high school investigating and participating in some preliminary work in a curriculum called DBT Steps A. Um, that's something that we're now exploring um, and we're doing that through our partnership with OCM BOCES and the Department of Mental Health, who's also supporting that. So that's currently where we are right now. Next question is, if no other resources available, should parents turn to virtual counseling with a provider over Zoom? Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Do you want to talk about, and a follow-up question from me is, you know, is there, for someone who is pursuing virtual versus in-person counseling, can you talk about sort of the strengths and challenges associated with either, either option? So my experience, I can only speak from my experience of it because um, <laughs> March 2020, I pivoted pretty quickly from, from in person, within a week in person to uh, virtual um, with all of my caseload. And I work with children as, as I, I wasn't at that point, but I work with kids as little as three and, and all the way through college and then some even beyond college. So for the older kids, um, I would say they, they complained about it more. Um, but they they could engage a little more easily. And I there are many college students that I work with that have gone off and it's very successful. If they're in New York State, I'm able to work with them. Um, the little kids were definitely more challenging. And I sort of switched gear to having, you know, a mom or dad there because somebody was either spinning in their chair or trying to play Minecraft or, um, you know, other things online. And I I I I get motion sick. So when the kid is spinning in their chair for 40 minutes, it's kind of hard for me to keep working with them. Um, so, so it was challenging with the little ones, but it is effective and it is way better than nothing, way better than nothing. So. So the next question is coming from one of our news organizations and uh, I'm going to ask Mrs. DeForest to answer and then Ms. Goodrum to answer, uh, Dr. Goodrum to answer, sorry. And this question is, why is it important to hold mental health forums like this? So Lori, you want to start? Sure, I think um, to bring the community get together to make it a focus and to be able to best help our students and provide us strategies um, and and to to focus on mental health as a normalcy. We all need help at times, and so it's important for us to to talk about it to make it accessible. Dr. Goodrum, you want to follow up on that? I would say it's important because. Um, Mental health treatment is done in a way that's called evidence-based, which is it's not uh, pulling ideas out of a hat and throwing it together. It's based on research 
it's based on good research. Psychologists, not to toot our, you know, our own horn, but we do really good research. We know statistics in and out. We study human behavior for a living. And so we can help parents wade through the muck and the moss and the exceptional child books and the this book and the that book that might speak to somebody, but might not really have good evidence for it to guide you. So without that, um, you know, parents have to be left to their own devices and struggling. Like, why not, you know, speak to folks who know kind of the data behind it to give you that clear perspective. And then the last um, question uh, is actually more of a state. I think it's a more of a statement and a challenge, which is I know that other school districts have therapy dogs daily in their schools, as well as morning health walks together to music. Can we get creative and add more of this at JD? And I think that's really a, a challenge to um, all of us to make sure that we're attending to the social, emotional and mental health of all of our students and staff. And so appreciate that um, to that to that participant. So thank you. Um, want to make sure everybody gets out here on time. Ms. DeForest, any or first any parting words? I just again want to thank Dr. Goodrum. Thank you for sharing um, so many <laughs> great, just wonderful and fantastic insights. Um, as Nate earlier said, as a parent, you know, have we all recognized ourselves in some of those things like oops, but also have we learned from them and you taught us to give each other the grace and ourselves the grace to be able to recognize sometimes our mistakes, but recognize that we can also all improve and that we have resources available to help us be better parents and teachers, educators, and, and colleagues and community members to support one another. So thank you so much, um, sincerely. And just thank you to everybody who participated for your honesty in the breakout sessions. That helps us get better as a district um, and better to, and we're all better together. So as JD, so thank you very much. Thanks everyone for participating. Dr. Groom, Goodrum, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come and uh, share your wisdom with us. Much, very much appreciated. Thanks all. And thanks for everyone for um, a really good night. I hope everyone uh, stay safe. And um, if we don't see it, enjoy a really nice holiday next week. Thanks, everyone. Bye.